Jesus. The name above all names. Amen. If you have your copy of God's Word, if you'd go ahead and open up to Revelation 6 for me. Revelation chapter 6. And uh, I just, by way of not really an introduction, but just a, a blessing. Um, I had not intended, when I started going through Revelation, I had not intended for it to be the blessing to me that it has been. Um, even from the beginning, as I read through these commentaries and I read what God is going, what God is doing at this point now and what He will be doing in the future, um, it has continued to reassure me, folks, because I know that God is just good. And all of this book shows the goodness of God. And so often we look at the end of the world and the wrath of God and the judgments and all that and go, ah! And we don't realize that even in that, God is still good. He can't stop being good because he's God. He always will be and has, he always has been and always will forevermore be God. And we must remember that. So let me open up our lesson tonight, our message tonight, or I should say my message tonight with a question. Have you ever heard of the phrase, whether it was in a movie or somewhere else, this is the coming of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, one of my, uh, one of my favorite I guess you could call it a Western. It's a modern Western uh, of all time. This movie, it has Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer and Sam Elliott, and I just blanked on the name of the other guy. It's called Tombstone. And at the beginning of the movie, um, they're down in, in, uh, in Mexico, and at the beginning of the movie, there's some Mexican cowboys that are killing some, fo some folks. And um, near the end of this particular scene, this guy just comes up, and he's quoting the book of Revelation in Spanish. And he's actually quoting uh, Revelation 21, Behold a white horse, and then on him uh, came a pale rider, and his name was Jesus. We so often hear of the Revelation, and we, we hear of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and it's terrifying to us, and it should be. But the good news is, we won't be here for it. We'll witness it, but we won't be here for it. So, as we look tonight at the first of the two seals, or I should say the first two seals, remember, everything we see, everything we've read about the seven churches and everything we have seen and moving forward, everything that we read about, we will witness, we will be in heaven for. And we won't be down here on planet Earth when all of this takes place. And literally, all hell is going to break loose as we see these seals and these trumpets and these judgments happen. So, with that being said, let's jump right in. First, the first of the four horsemen, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Then I saw the Lamb open up one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, pardon me, and a crown was given to him. And he went out as a conqueror in order to conquer. And we've already discussed who the Lamb is. That is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that's worthy to open up these seals because of what he did on the cross. Because of his being slaughtered on the cross. He alone is worthy to do any of this. And we see a break in worship because the four, one of the four living creatures pauses in worship to say, Come. And we see this heavenly response. And the heavenly response is this person, this being, that has a whole lot going on. Now, let me first and foremost say this. There is speculation that this is Jesus Christ. This is not, and I say this emphatically, and I will die on this hill. And I don't have many hills that I'll die on, but I'll die on this hill. This is not. Jesus Christ. You know how I know that? Two really simple reasons, both straight out of the Word of God, because I always use Scripture to interpret Scripture. First, who's the one that's calling the writer? 
who has opened up the seal is Jesus. It doesn't make any sense for Jesus to break a seal and jump on a horse and head down when he's got six more seals he's got to open up. It just doesn't make logical sense. And secondly, Jesus actually appears later on in the Bible to go to earth. In Revelation chapter 21, actually 19, I should say. Revelation chapter 19, if you've got a copy of God's Word, it says... A little something about our Jesus. In verse 11, it says, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. We see a white horse here in the first seal. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and he judges and makes war with justice. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. His name was written that no one but, him know, but himself knows. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on white horses. Notice that. This rider is not being followed by anybody. But Jesus is followed by the armies of heaven. Wearing pure linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. The, the picture that we have of the white horse in chapter 6 is a very, very different picture than we have of our Lord Jesus Christ when he finally comes to issue in his reign for a thousand years. Two very, very different people. But interestingly enough, there are some similarities here between him and Jesus. And that sim those similarities are what I want to talk about in this first seal. So we see five things about him. We see a white rider. He's holding a bow, he has a crown, and he goes forth to conquer as a conqueror and to conquer. Okay, so what all does that mean? That is actually a twofold meaning. First off, what color is typically associated with white? When you wave a white flag, what does it typically mean? I surrender, which hopefully, Lord willing, so if the enemy says, okay, ushers in peace, right? So this white horse that's happening is a time of peace, but it's being ushered by somebody who is a conqueror. And the name of that conqueror is Antichrist. This is the coming of the Antichrist. We'll actually see in clear detail what's going to happen with Antichrist later on in Revelation when we start seeing in detail what he's going to do to planet Earth. But this is the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. In case you're wondering, well, John, what happens during those seven years? Uh, hopefully, everybody picked up a, uh, a sheet of paper as they were coming in that has a diagram on it. Uh, that diagram is out of one of four uh, commentaries that I'm reading as I go through the book of Revelation and is a fantastic um, timeline on how things are going to happen. And I, honestly, I've never seen it outlined like this before. I've, I've seen it outlined in terms of the seven years of tribulation and the Antichrist and the breaking of the Israels, but I've never seen it line up with the breaking of the seals. And so it's wonderful to see this time frame of within a seven-year time period, you have the first seal and the second seal and the third seal, and then the fourth seal, something's going to happen. And, uh, and hopefully everybody grabbed that. If you didn't, if we ran out, let me know. I'll be happy to print you up a copy. But that was immensely helpful to me to be able to see this is, this is how the future is laid out. Okay? So this is the beginning of that seven-year time frame of tribulation. All right. But notice he's carrying something. He's carrying a bow. Now, what typically associated with a bow? Anybody in here, here ever shot a bow? What do you have to have to shoot a bow? Arrows, right? He doesn't have arrows, though. He's only got a bow, which tells us he is a fake conqueror. He is only being allowed to do what God allows him to do. He's going to conquer, but he's only going to conquer based off of what our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ allows him to do. And then we see that not only does he have a bow, but he has a crown. And, and we miss this because we don't read Greek. I mean, plain and simple, we don't read Greek. So I'm going to give you a Greek lesson. Because if I don't give you a Greek lesson now, you're going to completely miss it. And later on when we get to Jesus, it's really going to be a big deal. Uh, we saw this earlier with the seven churches, that Jesus Christ was going to give them a crown. There are two kinds of crowns in, uh, in Jesus' day, and there's two words for them. One is called a Stephanos, right? We get the word Stephen from that, right? Say Stephanos. That was horrible, like three of y'all said. Okay, let's say Stephanos. There we go, all right. 
Now say diademos, or just diadem. We'll say diadem. Say diadem. Here we go, okay? Those are the two kinds of crowns, and they're very different from each other. A Stephanos crown was a victor's crown that they got at the end of a race. It was a victory. It was a, woo you did it. A diademos crown is a king's crown. We, we sing the song, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him lord of all. Diadem, bring forth the royal crown. Put the royal crown on his head. And we see the vast difference when you go back to Revelation 19. Jesus is already wearing a crown. Here it says a crown was given to him. He's a false king. He's given a victor's crown, but it's a, a victor's crown in the sense of a race, not a, oh, you're a king. You've earned this crown, right? Jesus is already wearing the crown. He doesn't need anybody to put it on his head. He can walk up and put it on his head himself, right? Because he's Jesus, right? Jesus is the one true king. And then it says, a conqueror in order to conquer. Now, I mentioned already that a white horse means peace. The reason why I say that this is a white horse in peace, even though he's going out as a conqueror to conqueror, is in the process of conquering, he ushers in peace. Now, the other thing that we, we see here that's different from the Lord Jesus is this guy doesn't have any arrows, and it's a bloodless victory. If you were to go over to Revelation 19 and look, it actually talks about how Jesus' robe is dipped in blood, right? There's going to be some warfare going on when Jesus happens. This guy is slick. The, the, the peace that comes is a temporary peace, and we know that because it's the seven years of tribulation. And this peace is the bringer of the other three horsemen which are war, famine, and death. A false peace ends up being broken later on, as we're going to discuss in a minute. And because that war happens, war ushers in famine and death. And this peace is as a result of Antichrist. Now, we know from other parts in Revelation that Antichrist is really a slave to Satan. We know that Antichrist, in all likelihood, based off of what little I've read about the remainder of Revelation, he is possessed by Satan later on. He dies. He has a, a head wound. Somehow or another, he dies. And he is resurrected as a false Christ by Satan himself. He becomes the embodiment of Satan. He is a false Christ. So this is a satanic trap that Antichrist is bringing. A false peace. Because who is the true bringer of real peace? Jesus Christ. If you'll remember over in the Gospels, he says, my, my peace I bring unto you. My peace I leave with you. He leaves behind the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, the one who gives us a true, genuine peace. That's why as Christians, we look at this and we, we should realize, I don't have to worry about all this. I don't have to about worry about war. I don't have to worry about COVID. I don't have to worry about riots and protests. I don't have to worry about everything that's going on around me because on the inside, I've got the peace of Jesus Christ. And that surpasses all understanding. And that's what I really need in my life. That's what everybody's really looking for if you think about it. Did you know that there's been another time in our history when somebody said that they would bring peace and they actually ended up bringing war? I actually had a history lesson this week in the process of studying for this. You guys ever heard of a guy named Adolf Hitler? Same thing happened with Hitler. In fact, let me read you this out of one commentary. It may seem credible that the world, hovering on the brink of final disaster, could be so totally deceived. Yet this is exactly what happened on a smaller scale before the outbreak of the most devastating war to date, World War II. Adolf Hitler spelled out in detail his plans for a conquest in his book, Mein Kampf, which was published more than a decade before World War II began. Yet, incredibly, the Western allies, particularly Britain and France, persisted in believing Hitler's false claim to be a man of peace. They stood idly by as he reoccupied Rhineland, which was demilitarized after World War I, thus abrogating the Versailles Treaty. And then he annexed Austria, Sudentland, and Czechoslovakia. Des desperate to appease Hitler and avoid, and avoid World War, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain met with the Nazi dictator 
in Munich in 1938. When he came back from England, Chamberlain triumphantly waved a piece of paper which contained a worthless pledge of peace from Hitler and proclaimed, this is peace with honor, peace in our time. When Winston Churchill, you know Winston, I respect Winston Churchill, when Winston Churchill, who was one of the few that was not taken in by Hitler, when he rose in the House of Commons to declare that England had suffered a total unmitigated defeat, he was shouted down by angry members of Parliament. The deception of Hitler was nearly universal. Everyone misread his intentions. Only after he had invaded Poland in September of 1839 did Allies realize the truth, and by then it was too late. And we were into the World War II. We saw it coming and we did nothing. What does that sound like? Revelation. We, we've got another book that tells us exactly what's going to happen. And yet people want to be blinded by it. The Bible actually warns us about this kind of peace. About the kind of peace that Antichrist brings. In Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 14 it says this. They have treated my people's brokenness superficially claiming peace, peace. When there is no peace. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 says it this way. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. And interestingly enough, in 2 Thessalonians, the Bible tells us exactly how it's going to happen. It tells us in advance, here's what's going to happen with Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 9 through 11, it says this. The coming of the lawless one, Satan, is based on Satan's working with every kind of miracle, both signs and wonders serving the lie, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing, those who are dying. The world is going to be in chaos, and he's going to come and say, check me out. They perish because they did not accept the love of truth, and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion so they will be, believe a lie so that all will be condemned. Those who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. Daniel chapter 9, if you read Daniel and Ezekiel, Daniel is, man, you talk about a book that talks about the end of the world. Daniel talks about the end of the world all throughout his book. But Daniel 9 says the Antichrist is going to bring, out, bring about an agreement between Israel and everybody else that's going to bring peace to the world. And if you think about everything that has taken place over the last 2,000 years, Israel oftentimes is the center of our wars. They've been constantly at war. The Middle East hates Israel. The Muslims hate Jews. Everybody wants to make Israel go away. But Israel ain't going anywhere. There's a parallel passage over in Matthew chapter 24 that says this. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4 and 5. It says, Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. Don't be afraid. Because these things must take place, but the end is not yet. These things are supposed to happen. War is supposed to get ready to break out. Kingdom is going to rise up against kingdom. There's going to be famines and earthquakes. And all of these things are the start of what's about to take place. Just like when a woman goes into labor, she has those pains in her, in her, in her womb, in her uterus, that, trying to get that baby out. It's the same thing that's going to happen. Wars and rumors of wars and famines, everything that's starting to go on around us and has been going on around us for decades now. This is all the beginning of birth pains. It's telling us the end is coming. Get ready. So what usually follows peace? If it's a temporary peace, what usually follows after peace? And we've been in an ebb and flow for, for the last 2,000 years, and it's war. Right? You, you have 
war and then you have a temporary peace. And then somebody gets mad at somebody else and they say, we're going to chuck bombs at you and you have peace again, right? We've been going over terrorists in the Middle East for I don't know how long now, right? It seems like we're constantly at peace. And that's what seal number two is, the red horse. If you look with me in verses three through four, it says this. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come. Then another horse went out, a fiery red one, and its rider was allowed to take peace from earth so that people would slaughter one another. And a large sword was given to him. Now, it's interesting that the Bible uses two words to describe the horse, fiery and red. Red simply tells us it's war, blood. Fiery tells us it's bright, and it's massive, it's noticeable, it's there, it's going to happen. You're not going to be able to avoid it. It's kind of like when you have a bonfire in your backyard. You either got to do one of two things. You either got to contain it or put it out. It's going to happen. And what's interesting is this is not the wrath of men. This is not the wrath of Satan. But this is the beginning of the wrath and the judgment of God Almighty. We are not experiencing the wrath of God right now. Yes, we might be experiencing persecution. We might be experiencing troubled times. The Lord Jesus says, if you're living for me, you're going to have that stuff. But we are not experiencing the wrath of God as of yet like the world, like the world will in the future. And what's even more scary about it is it says, and its writer was allowed to take peace from the earth. In the divine sovereign will of God, God wants this to happen. It is, it is his will that war should break out. Now, in our minds, that doesn't make sense because, like, why would God want war to break out? Remember, all of this culminates in Jesus Christ coming at the end of seven years. If this stuff doesn't happen, Jesus doesn't come. So what do we know about this war? Well, we know a couple of things. It says, so that people would slaughter one another, and a large sword was given to him. Now, people already kill each other. I mean, that's what sinful human beings do. But they don't kill each other on the scale like what's going to happen here in the future. And the reason I know that is because the last sentence tells me it says, and a large sword was given to him. There's a couple of words for sword. We, we've, we actually talked about one a few weeks back when we talked about spiritual warfare Take up the sword of the spirit, and that word sword is gladius. It's the same kind of sword that a gladiator wears. This sword is not a gladius. This sword is what's called a makaria, M-A-C-H-I-A-R-I, a a makaria. It's a big sword. Think like the kind of sword that William Wallace and Braveheart swung, like the thing that doubles as a baseball bat, right? Big sword. The sword that's designed to give massive destruction. And in case you're thinking right about now, because I was like, okay, how bad could it be? And then I started thinking about the United States. The United States is a superpower in the terms of military. There's a reason why people don't mess with us. And there's also a reason why people don't mess with countries like China, Iraq and Iran, even though we're messing with them, and Russia, because we have nuclear capabilities. And to give you kind of a, and I, and I don't say these things to scare you, and kids, don't be scared. Jesus, this is part of Jesus. Connor's looking at me I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's okay, Connor. To give you an idea of the kind of, destru- of the destruction that's going to come, let me, let me put some kind of numbers on things, okay? So, the bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima that wiped out people, that one bomb wiped out 100,000 people. Russia, a few years ago, dropped a nuclear bomb that had the same amount of energy as 3,000 of those one bombs on Hiroshima. Can you imagine? If one bomb can wipe out 100,000 people, 3,000 bombs that can wipe out 100,000 people, that's millions. I looked up 
what our capabilities are for our cruise missiles. And our, our nuclear cruise missiles can travel 1,500 miles, and you can put a laser on them, and they can hit the doorknob on the back wall if I want it to. We're that high tech. Our snipers can kill people from two miles away. We have the ability to drop what's called the Moab, the mother of all bombs. And all a guy has to be doing is sitting in a camper with a little camera going and painting that target with a laser beam. And we can drop it from six miles up in the atmosphere and they'll never know what hit them. We can do that right now. And this is going to happen in the future. And with all the advances in technology, think about what we'll be able to do. This will make World War II look like child's play. It really will. And I don't say that lightly. Daniel 8, chapter 24 gives us an idea of why this happens. His power, this is talking about Antichrist. His power will be great, but it will not be his own. He will cause outrageous destruction and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the powerful along with the holy people. Daniel and Matthew both tell us that Antichrist is going to come and he's going to usher in a reign of peace. From what I can read in Daniel and in Revelation, that peace will be about three and a half years. It'll get us to the middle of tribulation time, roughly. And then something is going to happen in the middle of that time period where it's going to cause all hell to break out, essentially. And the Antichrist is going to set up what's called the abomination of desolation. For those of you who are like, what in the world is that? Antichrist is going to put himself in Jerusalem, in the temple. The dome of the rock, the thing that right now I believe Muslims possess, if I'm remembering correctly. Antichrist is going to take that over and say, worship me as God. The abomination of desolation. And when he does that, that will break a treaty and all of the world will try to kill him. And kill each other in the process. Those who support him will go to war with those who don't support him. And that war is going to last until Revelation 19 when Jesus comes back. War, famine, and death, all of those come together. As a result of this war, according to Matthew 24, 9, we'll actually see this in a few weeks, people will die. Many of God's people will die. In fact, Matthew chapter 24, verse 9 says it like this. They will hand you over to be persecuted, and they will kill you. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. And this sounds really, really scary. I mean, if I didn't know that this was the Bible, I would think this was the making of a really good horror film. You know, peace is going to come, and then a man's going to come from heaven, and he's going to usher in peace. But then all of the world is going to try to kill itself. Sounds like a really good horror film. But it's in the Bible. And as we talked about this morning, as I mentioned, if it's in the Bible, it means it's God's Word. It's inspired. These words that we're reading were there for a purpose, just like a talking donkey from this morning. This was given to us for a reason. So, so what is it that we can take away from this? What is it that we can get some encouragement from? Well, if you'll give me just a few moments, I can give you three things. First one, remember every single thing that we read about from the, from the throne room moving forward happens according to God's sovereign will. And the reason why it is God's will, the reason why God desires it to happen is this. It is to accomplish the final redemption of earth and to bring his people back to him. That's why Jesus took the scroll. It was to redeem back earth. This is Jesus redeeming back the, the planet that he created. We should be comforted by these things. And yes, I say the word comforted. 1 Thessalonians tells us something, and it's amazing. And this is a passage that we read so often, and it really is about the end times, but it should give us words of comfort because it says to give each other comfort. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Let me pause for a second. How does a thief in the night come? Unexpectedly, when you least expect him and you're not looking for him, but you should always be ready. 
Any person who is serious about home defense will tell you, you make sure you got everything planned out and laid out. Not like you don't go for insomnia. Obviously, you can't stay up all night long all the time. But you are ready for anything to happen. So when that thief comes, you're prepared. Just like Christians. Be ready for when Jesus comes like a thief in the night. Right? Be ready for him. Be anticipating him. Does that mean you shouldn't go to sleep tonight? No, please go to sleep tonight. Your body needs that rest. But make sure as you go to sleep tonight that you know that you know Jesus Christ, first and foremost. He'll come like a thief in the night. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman. It seems to be a running theme in the Bible. In times, labor pains, pregnant woman. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. In other words, Paul's saying, look, it shouldn't surprise you that this is going to happen. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. Spiritual warfare. Put on the full armor of God every day. For God did not appoint us to wrath. What more encouragement do you need as a child of God? When the wrath of God comes, you're not going to be part of it. You're safe. You're secure if you know Jesus Christ. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Verse 11, therefore, but because of all the stuff Paul's saying, because you can be asleep or awake and know Jesus is your king, know you're saved and you're not going to be under the wrath of God because of these things, because you're ready, what does Paul want? Therefore, verse 11, encourage one another and build each other up. And I love the last part. As you are already doing. It is our job as brothers and sisters in Christ to go to each other and say, Hey man, <laughs> it's going to be okay. Jesus reigns now and in the future. All of this is in part of his will. All of the time frame that he's got that's laid out is part of his sovereignty. It's part of what God the Father has chosen to happen on his divine timetable. We don't need to be worried. We don't need to be afraid. So the, one of my favorite hymns says, His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. Last thing. Actually, two more things. With everything that has happened in 2020, we have an absolutely fantastic opportunity to get people to think deep things. One of my professors when I was in seminary told me, actually he told the class I was in, Danny Sinkfield, who's my pastoral ministries professor, he said, guys, I'm going to tell you something that's going to sound morbid, but there's never a better time to talk about the Lord Jesus than at a funeral when everybody's talking about death anyway. And he's right. Because at, at a funeral, people are thinking about death and dying. People are thinking about, where did this person go? Where am I going to go? It provides natural conversations to people. Do you know where you're going? We know that this person knew where they were going because they lived like Jesus. Do you know where you're going, sir? Ma'am? Gives us a reason to talk about the end times. Gives us a reason to talk about Jesus. When somebody comes up and you says, man, I'm terrified that I'm going to die from COVID. You can say, you know what? I'm not. If I die, I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? Use the virus for good. Don't let it be for evil. And what's amazing is in the process of it, we obey our master. We fulfill the great commission. And last but not least, we must remember that in everything, because we have Jesus Christ in our hearts, we have the king of peace. We have what is in Hebrew, the, the Sar Shalom, the king of peace. And because of that, there is not a thing in this world that can remove that peace from us. Romans tells us 
Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If we have the peace of God in our hearts, we know these seals, yes, they should give us a heads up. They should give us an incentive to witness to people, but they should also give us an incentive to get to know our Lord better so that we can have His peace. Let me close this in a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word and I thank you for this wonderful book that you have inspired to give us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, this week I ask that you would help us to realize that yes, the end of the world is coming. We don't know when, but it is coming. Lord, help us to think about that. Help us to have eternity on our mind so that, Lord, we can be looking out for people who don't know you. We can witness to people and we can tell them, hey, you don't need to be scared. I know the King of Peace. Can I tell you about him? Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us and for your peace that surpasses all understanding. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.